Good day and thank you for joining us. I am Alexander Evans and I'll be talking about the history of steel pan in Belize and how it connects us to our Afro-Caribbean identity. Belize has been blessed with a multitude of ethnic, historical and regional identities. In this presentation, I will draw focus on our Caribbean identity by telling the story of the steel pan, the only new acoustic instrument to have been invented in the last century. How was it invented? By whom? How did it get to Belize? Let's start in 19th century Trinidad. The 1800s in Trinidad, particularly post-emancipation, saw a significant push and pull between the former enslaved people and the white colonial ruling class over the right to congregate, celebrate, and even worship. The century following emancipation saw the ruling class banning revelry, limiting the size of bands, and even outlawing the use of drums in the Canboule festival. The response, of course, was unrest and rioting with the famous Canboulé riot taking place in Port of Spain in 1881. This eventually led to drums being banned altogether in 1931. Now, why is this significant? Because drums are a part of who we are. I say we because this statement is true for everyone that is a part of the African diaspora, or as a friend of mine likes to call it, live as richer. You know, live as richer as opposed to die as poorer. I love it. <laughs> For our ancestors, drums were a vital part of their social, cultural, and spiritual identity. Drums were used in celebration and in mourning, for communication and for worship. Drums are our birthright. And in 1931, Trinidad, our brothers and sisters, had this birthright taken away from them. Now, I'm sticking on this point because this particular example explicitly demonstrates the type of systemic erasure of identity that is characteristic of post-colonial societies. It's a lot easier to control a people when you make them forget who they are. But our brothers and sisters didn't forget. They adapted. This limitation became an opportunity for innovation. Now, by this time, Canboulet and Carnival slash Carnival had been reinstated, though being tightly controlled by the colonial gatekeepers. During this festival, in lieu of drums, the masqueraders cut varying lengths of bamboo and used them as percussion, with the longer, heavier pieces being slammed vertically on the ground used to be used as bass, with the smaller pieces being held and struck and used as leads, or what they would call cutters. This was called tambu bamboo, and tambu bamboo bands started to form and became more prevalent in festivities. Then, of course, in 1935, tambu bamboo was also banned. <laughs> so in 1936, with the need to express themselves percussively, as is their birthright, the oppressed people took to the streets beating metal dustbins and biscuit pans. Eventually, they realized that when these pans were beaten to the point of developing indentations, there would kind of be a vague pitch when these indentations are struck. Now, there's no definitive singular individual credited officially with the invention of the steel pan, but the most popular story credits Winston, Spree, Simon, as the first person to put distinct notes in a pan and play a melody. Eventually, this led to larger oil drums being used, more notes being added, and extensive experimentation in developing different types of steel pans with various ranges, timbres, and musical functions. In the 1940s and 50s, the instrument started to spread to other Caribbean countries, including Antigua and Barbuda and Guyana. Then, in 1954, a Trinidadian student named Arden Williams took a pan with him when he went to attend the University of the West Indies, Mona, in Jamaica. 
This would lead to the formation of the first steel band in Jamaica. Now, this event would prove to be integral to the story of Pan making its way to Belize. During the years following the arrival of Steel Pan in Jamaica and the formation of their first steel band in 1954, two Belizeans of particular note would attend Uwe Mona and join the University Steel Band. These were Dr. Lennox Pike and Dr. Colville Young. The latter, we know, would go on to become Belize's Governor General and is undoubtedly one of the single most influential individuals to the development of music in Belize over the past several decades. In 1965, Doctors Pike and Young would return to Belize and form the All Stars Steel Band, Belize's first steel band, which was initially comprised of six members. So just to put it into perspective, this musical instrument hasn't even been in existence for a full century, not even 90 years, and it's been in Belize for almost 60 years. That's two-thirds, so for two-thirds of the amount of time that this instrument has been in existence, we've had it in Belize. I think that's pretty awesome. Now, <laughs> the formation of All Star Steel Band would lay the foundation for all subsequent steel bands being formed in Belize. Dr. Young would later go on to become the president of the then University College of Belize, UCB, where he formed another steel band. Then he was appointed as the governor general of Belize and passed on the musical directorship to his son, Lin. Now, Lin had been exposed to steel pan from an early age because of being around with all stars rehearsing. And he himself had attended U.S. St. Augustine in Trinidad, where he played with several bands. Eventually, a number of players who had graduated from UCB and were former members of the University Steel Band, they wanted to continue playing, naturally. So they formed the Pantemters Steel Orchestra in 1992. At the same time, the University College of Belize was undergoing significant changes, which led to the University Steel Band becoming dormant. At Lynn's recommendation, the unused instruments were donated to Grace Chapel Primary School. In 1993, the Grace Primary Steel Band was formed under the directorship of Miss Gloria Edwards. A year later, she passed it on to Mr. Paul Chris Bradshaw. This steel band would eventually become known as the Pantastic Steel Band. Several years later, Mr. Carlos Perota would take on the directorship and remains there to this day where the instruments are being used by both Grace Primary and Holy Redeemer Primary Schools. Mr. Bradshaw went on to direct the Wesley College Steel Band established around 2004. Another steel band formed as a result of Pantemters, as a direct result of Pantemters, is the Panorific Steel Band. In 1997, upon returning to Belize, Julieta Burroughs Lewis joined the Pantemters Steel Orchestra at Lin Young's request. A few years later, she moved to Belmapan to take up a position at Our Lady of Guadeloupe. In 2005, the school received a donation of steel pan instruments via the Governor General, Sir Colville Young, which marked the birth of Panorific Steel Band. What I hope to illustrate is that the formation of All Stars Steel Band in Belize in 1965 started a chain reaction which led to the formation of every subsequent steel band to date. All Stars led to Pantemters, Pantemters led to Pantastics, to Panorifics, to Holy Redeemer, to Wesley, and more. I, myself, started my steel pan journey in 2007 when I joined, you guessed it, Pantemters Steel Orchestra. Then in 2014, I became the founding director of the Pandemonium Steel Band. It's all connected and I find it fascinating to examine these threads of interconnectivity.
The steel pan is the youngest acoustic musical instrument in the world and is the ultimate symbol of resistance, ingenuity, and the importance of fighting for the right to express. Since its invention, the steel pan has spread throughout the region and its sound has become almost synonymous with the Caribbean. The steel pan is beloved around the world and it may never have existed had it not been for our brothers and sisters across the Caribbean Sea insisting on their right to express themselves culturally in the face of colonial oppression and attempted erasure. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the systems and mentalities built by these post-colonial ideals still exist today. As a result, we oftentimes fail to see the value and the importance of culture. Culture is most often a distant afterthought in the conversation of national priority. And it is imperative that we as a people dismantle that narrative. We must fight tooth and nail for the right to remember, embrace, love, and express who we are. Just as our brothers and sisters throughout the, throughout the live as richer, <laughs> throughout the diaspora have been doing for centuries, we have the same power flowing through our veins. I'll leave you with this. I believe that the most valuable thing we have is who we are. Thank you.